So how do you win a game of rugby? The short answer is to score more points, but any other answer takes significantly more breakdown. And for five years now, Simon Middleton and his gaggle of stony face specialists have been trying to work out the perfect answer to an even more specific question. Because the Red Roses quest was not just how do you win a game of rugby, they were pretty good at that, they did it 30 times in a row, but instead, how do you win this game of rugby? Five long years of focus on 80 short minutes that nonetheless managed to feel lengthier than the entire elongated cycle that preceded them. The Black Ferns, on the other hand, had been asking a similar question, but not quite the same one, because the Black Ferns had been waiting for this moment their entire lives. This weekend, England and New Zealand battled out in, and this is not an exaggeration, one of the best games of rugby ever played, with destiny at stake. Yes, these two teams met in Belfast a few years ago for a final, but this was different. A sold-out crowd at a national stadium, a home team with record numbers behind them, and an overdog so heavy they'd be kicked out of crafts, and a global audience like never before millions watching worldwide ready to be faced with what turned out to be probably the best Rugby World Cup final the sport has ever seen. This was a game England had been playing in their heads and on the training pitches for five years. But the first three minutes played out better than any of them could have imagined it, even the most fevered daydream. The Red Roses' start of this game was legitimately perfect rugby. It's the best passage you'll see, maybe ever. Technical, precise, intelligent, skillful, and powerful. It felt like the perfect answer to that question Middleton had been pondering for half a decade now. This is how you win any game of rugby. Thompson takes a restart and crosses the game line, and England play at another phase to create a better angle for Harrison. And then this is a brilliant kick. The Black Ferns back three are more dangerous than the cattle prod in the nursing home, and whilst you might think the solution is just don't kick to them, that'd be stupid, don't give them the ball, England knew territory could decide this game, so they just kicked smarter. With the Ferns forwards in field here, Harrison stands wide and kicks wider. Instead of wellying it as far as she can, she kicks shallower to split the back free, landing it on the grass between them, the ball bobbling twice before DeMant flips it in field to Holmes. But by the time she passes the mark with ball first bounce, the entire England pack are set and in position. They're ready to make these tackles, but the Black Ferns pack are still working back, having all been further in field here than their English counterparts when Harrison made the kick. This allows Cocaine to sneak over the ball and smuggle it back, winning the turnover, the whole thing aided by Matthews just rolling in Cox's way to prevent her digging or calling for help. Packer carries, and whilst the team are set to attack the next phase, Harrison doesn't want it, because she's spotted space in behind again. Hunter takes it in, and the next phase, Harrison dinks it over Holmes' head, a tricky bounce leaving her trapped on a try line. Holmes is absolutely brilliant here, but despite the pressure piling on after that, the Black Ferns continue and play six whole phases, trying to escape, trying to get out their own 22, and England contain them with relative ease. The Roses then run their usual charge down routine, nobody contests the breakdown and have everybody fly at the kicker, and it works nicely, demand unable to get it far beyond the 22. Granting England exactly what they were looking for in this whole thing, why Harrison kicked twice, they were looking for a set piece launch pad to begin somewhere in or around the 22. It's an old Eddie Jones tactic to try to pressure the opposition to giving you a line out that you can run a strike playoff that you've designed well in advance early doors, and England execute this with perfection. And they keep that up. Used to England morning from this and, well, every position, New Zealand's forwards begin a counter drive here, but Oldcroft goes off the top instead. England start incredibly static. No one is in motion, and so the Black Ferns kind of stand off. They figure this is just, it's going to be a crash ball. It comes to Scarry at the likely source of that crash, and Kildun runs a great line off her shoulder, both drawing Flula's eyes and hiding the arc run Aitchison is completing behind her, meaning Tui has to step in, and Dow can drift onto the outside of Holmes, coming up from fullback. Thompson has wrapped around her from the far wing as an insurance policy, but the pass is slightly off and flu that can recover and make the tackle. England's backs clear out and play another phase to keep the pace up. And then two more phases to allow the backs to reset and refine position on the other side. By the time Harrison calls the ball out, four of the England backs involved in the play on the other side have wrapped around to work on this side now, but only one Black Fern, fullback Holmes. This leaves New Zealand up against it with nobody in the 13 channel, forcing Woodman to watch both Scarrett and Kildun. The indecision allowing one to put the other in for a perfectly crafted try. Harrison's decision making 
striking, outstanding, and every player nailing their role effortlessly with enormous work rate. However, as the game went on, the Black Ferns responded to this kind of pressure better and better. Knowing what England want from them, the Black Ferns here decide instead to try and run the ball from their own goal line. They're not going to kick for touch, they're not going to look to give them a line out. And it almost blows up in their inexplicably always grinning faces a few times, but they eventually work it beyond the 22 and into a realistic, less pressured position. Here, with this carry by Bremner. Set into a 1 3 2 2 formation, the Ferns skip their forwards altogether and slide Tui into first receiver. She switches to Flula to put her in some space. However, as they hit half, way, New Zealand instantly fold into a 2-4-2 structure, changing entirely, and with demand in this ruck, Harini slides into the boot to act as a fly half. Since she takes position so late, England aren't expected to play in behind, they're only really looking at these four as crash up options, they're expecting just a straight crash ball, but the added bulk of Harini over other fly halves requires a double tackle to get to the ground, and England can't really fold the adapted shape with having had to watch four players combined with the red card impact and usual stress that 10 phases does to any team, results in Vicky Cornborough and Sarah Hunter alone watching 20 metres of space on this blind side. Cornborough absolutely hairs it to get across, but this just makes it easier for Letty Ayinga to step. And whilst Lucy Packard just about scrags her to ground, Harrison, filling the winger's role, goes off her feet at this ruck and it grants New Zealand a penalty, from which they go to the corner and score almost immediately here. Look how quick this try is, it's just very, very simple. Wayne Smith hasn't only reinvented the Black Ferns culture and reinvigorated its players, he's implemented changing, shifting shapes and structures that are on the absolute cutting edge of rugby coaching, creating an attack that could eat up 80 minutes against any defence in the world. However, England's genuine attempts to do the same, to evolve their game plan and play far more attacking rugby, found themselves kind of dismantled by the first red card in the Rugby World Cup final ever, this dismissal of winger Lydia Thompson. Compare the slickness and ambition of England's free attacks before the red card to their starter plays after. This is just England's second attack of the game, not long after the kill done try, but before the red card. The setup is exactly the same as for the first score. The players are running basically the same lines, but this time Skaz does drop it off to Kildun, who careers over the game line, and Flula attempts to slow the ball down here, which leaves the Black Ferns number short on this side, and Thompson once again is wrapped around. England eat up a little bit of their own space, which is kind of pet peeve of mine, but in panic, New Zealand over-contest the next breakdown and give away a penalty that grants England a position to muscle Amy Cocaine over for a first try of the match, to put them 14-0 up. This, however, is their first attacking set with 14 players. Where England had multi-phase options before, it's now just a simple crash-up job, and they set into a very standard 1-3-3-1 shape, the shape they've been running all World Cup in order to kind of hold things back, and just work the phases until invariably a penalty is blown in one direction or the other. England went wide off all three set pieces they had during their time with 15 women. They did not go wide off first phase in the entire rest of the game, and only three times over the thompson 62 minutes, did England string together more than two passes in sequence. Once it's just this to get Scarrett into more space for a crash ball, and once results in this interception by Holmes, but the third, the third shows what really could have been done. Similar to the Black Ferns earlier, England changed their structure as they pass halfway. They shift into a really nice 1 3 2 2 structure, a shape they haven't run all tournament, a new attacking shape that they were clearly holding back for the final, and it works flawlessly. The forwards start as one homogenous blob, but Scarrett cause a play and they shuffle out into two groups of two with one centre plumped with either pair. Harrison hits behind the first shape, they're great dummy runners and they really commit to their lines, and Scarrett draws the final defender, now adjusting to her, on the edge as the pod drifts outside her. Davis draws the cover and puts Shauna Brown away down the right. This is a set of tactics England have clearly worked on all summer, holding back for the final only to abandon them when the red card came, to only try and run them once in the last five minutes when they needed a score in order to try and win the game. And they kind of went, well, let's just try it anyway, let's just, let's just try it anyway and see if it works. And it did. We saw how effective this attacking shape is, so it does beg the question. Should England have just persisted with the game plan they were working on regardless of the red card? Where some teams go completely to pot when reduced to 14 and others adapt seamlessly, England landed somewhere in the middle. There were things they threw out in moments of panic which are very understandable, it's a really pressurised situation, but they just went back to the plan B they've spent a year developing and slotted it in effortlessly. They've been playing this plan B primarily all year. Yet as well as throwing out the really advanced stuff, they showcase a few moments of panic. There are 33 seconds between time being blown back on after Thompson's red card and Georgia Ponsonby scoring the Black Ferns first try of the game. 
Now, it's not the first small try the dominant Red Roses pack have conceded over their 30-game winning streak, but it's by some distance the simplest. It's an incredibly easy peel that catches England in a moment of shell shock. It's the kind of thing Ward and Allcroft normally snuff out right away. You can go back over how many other games of teams trying this, they stop this immediately. Yet, here, they were caught so off guard. Just look how defeated Marley Packer's body language after that ball goes down. Ball to the tail means England can't get stuck in as soon. There's less opportunity to take out any frustration, yet in every other area, no one hangs around. The ball goes directly into the corner and then straight into the air, looking to catch England while still at that emotional low ebb. The Ferns knew England will be shocked, so they hurried things right up so they can exploit that before they get over it. However, where England kept them all, New Zealand saw this as a chance to use the extra space to vary their game very, very nicely. Here, they crab them all very slightly inwards, so England have to defend with a guard on either side. Cocaine on the open, and Dow here on the blind. Now, Abby Dow has been generally filling in to defend both wings, but this ties her to just one side. She can't work across. Fitzpatrick gets the ball at first receiver already opposite Matthews, making Harrison here pretty much irrelevant in the defensive line. In theory, she's way too tight, but that's because Demant starts in a deliberately kind of shit position, really close to the line out, pulling Harrison opposite her, meaning she's now defending in a kind of shit position. The Kiwi 10 is extremely late to show her hands and move into the fly half position in the boot. Flula's line doesn't actually engage or block anyone it just slows Matthews by half a second but New Zealand have the advantage of every player being one step wider now than England and it has a knock-on effect. Aitchison is on the inside of Tui so Kildun has to worry about doubling up on her meaning she stands between Tui and Holmes. Demant throws the mispass and with one woman short Kildun has to cover two and a half players on her own as New Zealand have worked it out the wing so quickly. She does a pretty great job but Leti Iyengar's stutter step the kind of you know, this this great dummy step forces her to just take a moment of going, ooh, what if, what if she just step back inside? What if she does stop? to stop her momentum and allows Leti Iyenga to finish in the corner. The Black Ferns scored four tries directly from the dismissal of Lydia Thompson, free from exploiting there being nobody in her position and one leveraging the emotional impact. This is immediately after half time. England defend half the width of the field with only Scarrett and no winger. Spotting this, Demant and co almost panic to get the ball at ASAP. Fitzpatrick runs a lovely line, but Cleal doesn't buy it, immediately drifting on. Holmes' line is nice enough to half engage Scarrett and get a just inside Flula. At this stage, it's essentially a foot race between Flula and Skaz for the touchline. Flula, not having to adjust from covering a second woman already, wins it and Scarrett buys her dummy! New Zealand flood brilliantly and clinically. Kildun can't afford to commit to anyone other than Holmes and the brief step inside shifts Kildun's body weight against her, meaning she can't get onto the outside either, allowing Holmes to put Flula over for yet another try in this tournament. This brought the scores level and went on to set up an amazing finale. A beat that somehow outdoes Bernard Foley and the kick that never happened is rugby's most absurdly dramatic moment of 2022. A succession of free lineouts from the best set piece team in the world leading to this. A lineout steal for the ages. On all three occasions, England lineout caller Abby Ward calls a ball to herself. Now, cautionary tales about this are littered throughout rugby history, be it Martin Johnson and Justin Harrison in 2003, Chris Robshaw in 2015, or seemingly Victor Matfield in every single game he ever played, yet Ward gets away with it twice in a row. The Ferns do guess it's going to Ward. First time, Harini jumps across to try and prevent them all from forming, but Davison is wise to it and penalises her right away, being right in position to do so. Second time, it's far more dynamic, unpredictable. So whilst New Zealand do assume it's her, they're late to work out where she's going to be, and it means she regathers the ball cleanly and gets grabbed in the air, granting England another penalty and hence a third shot, which is the one where it gets really interesting because the Black Ferns have found the pattern. On every line out she throws in this game, Lark Davis takes a little step to the side and then, on the count of three, throws in. Step, one, two, three. It's the cue England are ready to go. The sign, the timing is on. It's just the cue for them to start. And on the penultimate line out, we see Bremner notice this. She points and shouts as Davis takes a step, then steps in to lift herself. Ward beats them in the air, but she's got the pattern down. You don't know what's happening. Then... Something weird happens. The biggest criticism of the final line out is not so much that Ward calls it to herself, but that she takes it static. It's obvious. It's always going to her. Look at this. But this is the one line out where the timing seems slightly off. Davis takes her step and Ward begins to shuffle. She gets into a final position at the front, but the ball doesn't leave yet. There's another two seconds. Likely knowing the pressure, Davis takes two seconds longer than usual to throw in. The Black Ferns have already good as cracked this code, and the extra few Mississippis means Ward is stuck static at the front. 
and Nawu knows exactly where it's going. Ward needs to take it cleanly to form a decent maul. Nawu needs only get a hand in first. So she reaches forward, slapping the ball just anywhere. It does not matter at all. It's risky as hell because if Ward takes this, Nawu is sufficiently off balance and there's basically a big gap in the Black Ferns defense that allows the Red Roses to blow right through the Kiwi pack and win the World Cup with them lacking a focal point to focus their counter drive. And yet it comes off. She gets a hand to it. She steals the ball, and the ball is kicked off the pitch. Things coming off has become rather a theme for the Black Ferns of late, because this was a moment good as written in the stars, where England had waited five years for a chance to become immortalised as the best team the world has ever seen. New Zealand's 23 had waited their entire lives just to be taken seriously. This Saturday represented the biggest moment in the history of women's sports in New Zealand. The day a team who were gutted and shoved aside just two years ago, whose concerns over their well-being were ignored by their union just months ago, achieved the impossible. Cheered on by not just a record crowd at Eden Park, but a truly remarkable number on TV as well. 27% of the Kiwi population and more people watching live than watched the men's final in 2015. All behind a team who spent so long scrambling to be seen. For five years, England asked, how do you win a game of rugby? Well, for the 32 years since their first international, the Black Ferns have been asking, what else do you need us to do? And on Saturday, that answer came. Except it was the New Zealand public asking the same question back. What else do you need us to do to win this game of rugby? An incredible crowd championing their team through the impossible. This England team was supposed to be unbeatable, and yet it came off, with a crowd behind them every step of the way. Knowing if they keep giving this team what they need, winning that game of rugby will remain a mere formality. And the World Cup comes to a close. It's over. What a amazing tournament it's been. Um, I know for certain I'm going to miss it. Um, it's been a hell of a thing. Thank you to everyone that's watched all the videos throughout the tournament. I didn't quite manage to make as many as I would have hoped over this tournament. But, you know, it's only going to continue and build and build and build. And obviously we've got... 2025 to come um apologies for the popping throughout this video i put a little warning on the beginning but i've had to move to a new microphone and it as a whole deal i didn't work things out in time and didn't have time to re-record the audio and it's, it's all a bit of a nightmare um but i yeah i hope you enjoyed that regardless hope people have enjoyed the world cup and i'll see you very soon for a video on france versus south africa in the men's tournament which i obviously covered that fixture from the women's um earlier you know a month or so ago um and I'll see you beyond that for far more content on women's rugby going forwards. Rugby. New Zealand! Do tira mai na iwi Ta tai ta to e Do tira mai na iwi Ta tai ta to e Paia Love you, baby!